All right. As you know, we're in Acts, and we've been and we are been we've been following Paul in his second missionary journey, and now they have moved into Europe. He, Silas, and Timothy have preached in the cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And in each of those cities, if you remember, mobs led by unbelieving Jews ran them out of their city or put them in jail. And uh, we saw last time that the Jews from Thessalonica, who were so upset with them in Thessalonica, found out they were in Berea doing the same thing. So they walked the 45 miles to Berea and get them out of that town. The Christian brothers in Berea took Paul away to Athens. Now remember, that's some 250 miles away. And when they got him there safely, Paul then sent them back with instructions to bring um, Timothy, allowed to get Tim, Silas and Timothy to him as soon as possible. But now, Paul is alone in Athens. He doesn't know a single person there. He, he's he's going to be there alone for a while, okay? And, he, and, you know, he's always ministered with other people, with someone else, except, of course, when he went to Tarsus. He probably did that on his own, but that was very early in his uh, Christian life. But now, you know... You know, it's difficult to minister when you're alone. I mean, these, are, these people are presenting something entirely different to the Jews than has ever been thought of, pretty much. Well, actually, they're presenting the, the, they're presenting the Messiah, but this is, they're not expecting this Jesus to be the Messiah. So doing it alone is a difficult thing. You know, Jesus, even when he, you know, it's difficult to do it alone. Jesus, even when he sent the disciples out for the first time, remember, he sent them out in pairs. Um, let's look at that. Let's look at Mark. Who's got that? Mark 6, verse 7. I've got that. And Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs, and he was giving them authority over the clean, unclean spirits. Yeah, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. You know, we only see that in Mark's gospel, but I think it's very important. Why did he send them out in pairs and not alone? For what? For support. The witness of two people. The witness of two people, sure. I mean, because, what's that? Accountability, sure. All these things, they, they, all this thing, they all needed the encouragement. They needed the support and the accountability. That's a great thing, yeah. Um, you know, even in pairs, I'm sure they were scared. You know, can you imagine going out for the first time presenting this to the Jews? I mean, I'm sure it was a thing and discouragement would have come, but there's always strength. In numbers and you know one of my favorite well we love this verse that from uh, Solomon he wrote in Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 through 12 read that Brian two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor for if either of them falls the one will lift up his companion but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up furthermore if two lie down together they keep warm but how can one be warm alone and if one can overpower him who is alone Two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Yeah, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Woe to the one who falls down when there's not somebody there to lift him up. Then he finishes, he says, a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Is not torn apart. Uh, wait a minute, we got two here, not three. Um, cord of three strands. Who's the, who's the third? God. Yeah. God is the third. So, I can tell you, every bit of that first is true. Yeah. But I'm glad there's three. <laughs> Being a widow, I am glad oh, there's three. That has been my... I, oh, I, I'm sure. I, I bet that's so true. Okay, so, but Jesus sent these guys out in pairs. Okay, so um, um, <clears throat> who went out with the disciples? Who was that third chord? If I mean, how was God there with them? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yeah, how? Because he's not, Holy Spirit's not in their hearts yet, not in their lives. It's in Paul's life. It, well, it's not in his heart, but it is now. No, I did is now. But, but I mean, when the disciples were sent out. Yeah, you know, when the disciples were sent out, it was not, okay? And what it said in the verse, it said he began to send them out in pairs, and he was giving them the authority over the unclean spirits. So the Holy Spirit was going out with them, Okay. He was going out with them, and he gave them the ability to do this. I can't imagine being able to do that. But, you know, he gave them the ability to do that. Okay, so, and folks, his spirit is with us, too. There's not one of you. There's two There's two of you, and with with a partner, there's three. Yeah, Tom. I forget where I said it, but he also says, uh, 
where two or more Christians are gathered, there is a church. Yeah, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So see, that's that chord of three again. When you've got two, you've got three, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you, that's helpful. So um, this is why Paul usually had a companion wherever he went. Of course, first he had Barnabas, right? And now he has Silas. And, uh, but right now, he's alone in Athens. And it's important to realize that he's alone. So let's go on to Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, the spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. Yeah, so, so Paul here is alone in Athens, we've said that, waiting for Silas and Timothy to come from Berea. But he's waiting for them before he begins the ministry. So he's kind of walking around, and he's, he's waiting for them. But his spirit became provoked within him. Uh, provoked is the Greek word paroxino, and paroxino means stimulated, irritated, aroused. Why was his spirit aroused and stimulated? Because there were so many idols in that town. Yeah. Okay, before we talk about that, yes. And before we talk about that, let's talk about Athens, the city of Athens, okay? Athens was named for Athena, right? Mm -hmm. The virgin goddess. And the crown of, of Athens is, of course, the Parthenon, which was dedicated to her, all right? Now, Athens, in its prime, which was during the 4th and 5th centuries B.C., was the greatest city in the world. Um, it excelled in art, literature, architecture, and philosophies. The, uh, and Athens was home to some of the greatest minds, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. I mean, they had some of the greatest minds in the world. And it's funny though, although Athens was this great major city in the world, it was not the capital of the province. Corinth was the capital of that province, but Athens what remained the intellectual center of the ancient world. All right, now, as Paul was walking through Athens, okay, it looks like something grabbed his, one thing grabbed his attention. And it wasn't the beautiful architecture. It wasn't the, um, the, the people talking, the great minds that were there. What grabbed his attention? The idols. The, the idols. idols. Yeah, the fact, that, the fact that the city was full of idols, okay? And Luke actually uses the Greek word katedolos here. And katedolos means full of idols, but it actually means drowning in idols. It means wholly given over to idols, all right? Now, as Paul walked around Athens, he would have seen, you know, altars and statues to the various gods, Ares, Bacchus, Eumenides, Neptune, Athena, all these different gods, okay? And um, Pliny, who was a Roman lawyer, and Pliny was also the author of what's considered the first, in, first known encyclopedia, the Na Naturalist Historia, he testified to the fact that there were over 30,000 public statues in Athens at that time, 30,000. And there were many more in the private residences because there were 10,000 people in Athens. So you can imagine all the statues and altars they had in their residences as well. Uh, and Petronas, who was another Roman novelist, he once said, it's easier to find a god in Athens than it is to find a person. So uh, because when you think of 30,000 statues, 10,000 people, there's a lot more statues than there are people. And Paul was not impressed at all with these idols or statues. Rather, he was provoked. He was irritated by all this rampant idolatry. And all this was repulsive to him. And you know, what's interesting is we see this same anger in Scripture from some of God's other servants. So let's go to Exodus 32 and, and look at what's happening in Exodus. Then the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Yeah, uh, I mean, here you've got Aaron making the golden calf, right? And um, Moses, when he came, you know, Moses was provoked to anger. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, am I at the right place? No, here we see Aaron making the golden calf. Yeah, for the Jews who demanded it. They demanded it because Moses wasn't coming back. Moses had been gone how long? 40 Almost 40 days. I mean, who lives on the mountain for 40 days when you probably didn't take much with you, right? 
and I don't know that there's a lot of water up there. You know, who knows? But they were worried that he wasn't coming down, and so they needed something to worship. Can you imagine? These people needed something to worship, so they had him build a golden calf. And he even says, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I mean, Aaron was being taken over by this as well. But then Moses comes down, doesn't he? And he sees Israel dancing around the idol. And he, what did he do? He threw, he threw the tablet. Yeah, he threw the tablets down. Yeah, do you remember what happens next? Let's read. Let's read Exodus 32. That's it. Oh, yeah. That, okay, you're ahead of me then. So read that. Who's got Exodus 32, verse 20? And he took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Yeah, so he, I mean, this is how upset he is, uh, Moses is over this. He grounds it up and he makes them drink the idol. What a waste of good gold, you know, but... <laughs> You know, and, you know, the people had thought Moses was gone. The people had thought Moses was gone. They needed a God. They needed something. And they didn't, they didn't trust that Moses was coming back. Okay? That just shows that God has put in every human the need to worship something. Yeah, I think you're right. It's true. Yeah. And, and that's why they didn't know God, and so they made their own. Absolutely. How appropriate he is to follow Sean's sermon. Isn't it? Yeah, Y'all have a pretty stable contemporary yep. chapel. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right well, <laughs> well, I mean, this is what Paul is seeing in Athens, right? He, I mean, thousands of idols, thousands of gods, okay? Or hundreds of gods, at least. And, and you know, can, you, can, you can imagine how easily he, how he was stimulated, angry, and how he was aroused, you know, because God hates idolatry. And so should we as believers. So should we. Sin should provoke us all, as it did Paul. I mean, our sensitivity to, to sin, folks, is a direct correlation to our relationship with God. How sensitive are you to the sin that's around you? How easily are you agitated or irritated by it? You know, if we're not easily agitated, then we're too, we've been too... Well, yeah, too worldly and too we 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 become too used to it. Yeah, right. Steve, yes. This may be something you're going to get to, but it's amazing that these were the most brilliant minds on earth, and they were looking for truth, and they were looking for all these things and searching, you know, <coughs> science, everything, mm -hmm. and yet they had more idols than anybody. And I kind of think of America. We think we're so smart and we're trying to figure everything out. But we don't know God, yep. and, it, and it's it's a terrible. It's situation. interesting. The smarter we seem to get, the or the more intellectual we get, the more we get away from God, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. The more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. And see, that's what we're seeing here in Athens. Yeah. No, I didn't have that, but that's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, um, so Paul is going. If Paul's going to wait for Silas and Timothy, I think this idolatry thing probably changed his mind. So let's go on to the next verse, Acts 17, verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Yeah, Paul can't remain quiet. I mean, he moves right into action. When he sees this, he knows he's got to speak. And as usual, where does Paul go first? The synagogue. Okay, He goes to the synagogue, and it's probably on the Sabbath because in the Sabbath, you're asked to speak. If you're, you know, if you're that, if you're a person that can speak and goes in. So he, so he is most likely asked to speak. And it was during that time that, of course, he's preaching the gospel. Okay. And we see no results from this in scripture, but we see that he is there reasoning with them. And if you remember the, the Greek word reasoning is uh, dialogomai. And dialogomai, of course, means to dialogue. It means to discuss. It means to dispute. And it means to reason. So Paul, again, wasn't just preaching. He was dialoguing with the Jews in the synagogue. He was answering their questions. He was presenting with them material. He's giving a very pervasive, persuasive speech, but he's dialoguing with them back and forth about, about um, all of how the scripture actually points to these different things that, were, that, that spoke to the, to the um, Messiah. And, he, and uh, so he, as he's doing this, this seems to be a very good 
uh, presentation because he seems to get a lot of people believing by doing this dialoguing method instead of just preaching. Okay. And this is the only time it really is mentioned <clears throat> that he reasoned. That's right. No, it's the only and, time that he. Yeah. That, yeah. That it's not mentioned before. I mean, that's not to say he didn't do well, that before, but but specifically because this is Athens, Luke said he reasoned. <laughs> Right, but the dialoguing mostly goes on with the Jews anyway because they're looking for a Messiah, you know? And so he's reasoning with them through the Hebrew Scripture, you know? through the, he's, he's, he's going through the Hebrew Scripture and he's, he's pointing out how um, the Hebrew Scripture actually shows that the coming Messiah must suffer, must die, and then he'll rise from the dead. And how, how that exactly what happened with Jesus. So he's, he's answering their questions and this is this is really working for him. Well, you know, in Berea, though, there was a lot of intelligent reasoning going on. I guess you could call it reasoning because they were studying the scriptures when well, Paul was talking. Well, they well they were checking him out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and, now Athens, there, he did not plant a church there. No, no, he didn't. That's the only place that he did. He really he didn't. No, thought they were too smart. Yeah, they probably they did. Didn't, yeah, they didn't come together. Yeah. But he was reasoning with philosophers here. Well, we're, get, we're getting to that. You see, first he's reasoning with the people in the synagogue, but then he goes out to the marketplace, to the Athenian Agora, which is the marketplace. It's the center of the public and business life of the city, okay? People came there daily to this marketplace to hear people speak or to see, to learn the latest news and then discuss it. And, you know, they're, they're, they're listening to these people who have something they thought needed to be said, something new. And one of those people right now is Paul, and they're listening to Paul, okay? So let's go on to verse 18. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him, and some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. Yeah, so here you've got Paul presenting the gospel of Christ in the marketplace, and he's getting the attention of the Epicureans and the Stoics. Okay, now everybody knows what they what they believe, right? Yeah, I didn't either. So uh, <laughs> Epicureans per pursued pleasure as the chief purpose in life, and they valued most of all the pleasure of a peaceful life, free from pain, and uh, and free from disturbing passions and all superstitious fears, including the fear of death. Okay. Doesn't, sound like doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. They uh, it, they believed the purpose of life was to be happy, was to be prosperous and free from stress and pain. Sort of sounds like us, doesn't it? Yeah. I have a Christian friend who said to me this week, "All I want my children to have is just to be happy." Yep. And I had to leave. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> well, the epic, and you know. I mean, I, I really. I mean, I had to. Sit my mouth and say, I really have some things I need to do. I just... Yeah. Well, um, and you know, the Epicureans basically had a deistic concept of God. Um, they believed that God created the world, but then he left it to take care of itself. Okay, that's the Epicureans. Now, the uh, Stoics, on the other hand, the Stoics believed that, that the practice of virtue was enough to achieve a well-lived, flourishing life. Okay? To the Stoics, the universe, the universe, men and animals are all parts of God. So Stoics are pantheists. God is the universe and the universe is God. Okay, when man dies, his soul returns to the great soul and there's no afterlife. All right. So Stoics, um, get, Stoicism gave rise to the strong, a strong self-control, self-sufficiency and an emotional indifference to life situations. They prided themselves on their ability to take whatever came their way. Okay, so this is the people, the Stoics and the Epicureans. These are the people that are listening to Paul, all right? So the atmosphere in the Athenian Agora must have been not a very eager place to hear about a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus, who came to die for our sins. You know, this they'd never heard this before. So they, they're, they're, um, they're, so what, what are the Epicureans? They're mocking. They're mocking Paul saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? 
Now, understand the word babbler there is the Greek word sperma, spermologos. And it's a, it's a compound word, sperm, which means seed, and logos, which means pick up or collect. So basically, they're calling Paul a seed picker. What is this seed picker? What is this seed picker, this gossiper, this babbler? See, that's, that's how they get babbler. What they say is, is one who picks up, he picks, makes his living by picking up scraps, okay? Just as a gossiper would. I mean, this word was used by the Athenians to describe loafers, people that would pick up scraps in the market. And it came to be used to mock people who picked up a scrap of knowledge here, a scrap of, a scrap of knowledge there and they would bring it and put it together. And that's what they're saying to Paul. What is this, what is this seed picker know? What is he saying? Aren't they kind of describing themselves, right? On, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, definitely, yeah. But the Stoics, the Stoics are, yeah, the Stoics are curious. They, they say he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. And wait a minute, Paul's talking about Jesus, isn't he? But they say strange deities. I don't know if he's there. I don't know if Paul's talking about Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. You know, because they could take that as deities. I don't know. One other explanation I found is that that the word Jesus in the Greek is it it it, it acts as the power of healing when Paul spoke that. But when he spoke of the resurrection, that's the Greek word anastasis. And anastasis, they could have taken that to mean the goddess of restoration. So when you've got Jesus, which is in the mas masculine, and Anastasis, which is in the feminine, then you have a, um, a new divine couple. You have the res resurrection and Jesus. And so, you know, that's why, that's what they're hearing because they've never heard any of this. So who knows, but they're asking, they want to know about these strange deities. The concept of one God to their mind, God is plural. That's right. Oh no, God is plural to them. They can't imagine a, a, an individual single God. Yeah, they can't really see that. Yeah, so they want to know all about this. Yeah, I mean, you're hearing God, the Father, <coughs> and then Jesus, God, the Son. Yeah. And so and where's the mama? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the good thing here is that we see Paul preaching Jesus. We see him preaching his life, his death, and his resurrection. And he's reasoning with these people in the marketplace. The full gospel message is being spoken. So we see that in scripture that he's doing that. All right, let's go on to the next verse, to, uh, um, to uh, Acts 17, verse 19. Well, just one comment about that, too, because yeah. when they said he seems to be pro a proclaimer of strange deities, yeah. that was also against the law. It was No, it was against the law. Which we yeah. get to later. But. Well, it, it, it was against the law, and, and we'll get to that probably uh, by the time, we'll probably get to that next week, yeah. Okay. So, seventeen nineteen. Yeah. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming. Yeah, so Paul's message created a stir with these Epicureans and the, and the Stoics, and they bring him to the Areopagus, okay? Now, the Areopagus was Athens' chief legislative and judicial council. Now, Areopagus, it, it comes from two Greek words, Ares, which means um, the god of war. You know, Ares is the god of war. And then Pegasus means hill. So this is the hill of Ares. Now, what is Ares? La Ares is Latin name, do you know? Mars. Mars, and that's how we get Mars. In your Bible, it probably calls this Mars Hill, okay? And that's from the Latin, okay? So that's how we get Mars Hill. But this is actually the Areopagus or the Mars Hill. Yeah. Eddie and I were so fortunate that last September we got to go see all of this. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to go to Greece, or go on a tour following Paul's steps, do it. I'm not kidding. It means the world to me okay. that I got to do that. Mars Hill is, um, the Parthenon is right here, and then you go down that little hill, and right the next hill is Mars Hill. All of this is right there, and the Agora is just right down that hill. Yeah. It's all right there. And to see it and to know that Paul did what he's doing right here, yep. it's, it's, if you ever get a chance to do it, it is worth every dime we spend. And you can see from where they took him from the Agora up he to Mars Hill, on, right? Standing on Mars Hill, you yep. look up, and he was looking at Athena, this giant, giant. Right idol that's yep. there. It's, 
I just can't imagine. And and I'm thinking about those people that had never. I mean, this wasn't, but what, twenty years after Jesus' resurrection? Uh, twenty 30? to th twenty to thirty, yeah, okay. in that in that range, so, yeah. So this twenty news probably has not really gotten there. This is the first time they're ever hearing anything like this. These people have been worshiping that Athena for their whole life. Right. And think about it, if you had done that, and then you have this man coming in saying, but there's this one true God, you'd think he was crazy. You would think he was crazy. Yep. They, had sure. a, they had a point. I mean, I mean, they had a, yeah. they, they, they well, I mean, it's how they've been taught. It's how they've been taught, right? And that's, that's, that's but awesome. that's why they're taking. They worship every day these gods. But that's exactly why they're taking him to the Areopagus. Mm -hmm. Believe they're not beating him to yeah. death. Yeah. See, we. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They are going to let him well, speak. Well, so. yeah, they were too sophisticated to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, and and you know the Areop the Areopagus that they licensed and they licensed all these traveling lectures to make sure that they, that that they could have the that they, that they could have the freedom to actually do this. Okay. Yeah. Now, remember, he's not being taken there under arrest. He is voluntarily going with them to appear before the Areopagus because they do give this. But then you're right, Eddie, that he's presenting another God. Is That's illegal. But he does it really smart. And actually, <laughs> and, and actually with, with our time, we're going to stop there today and oh, pick cool. it up. <laughs> we'll pick it up next week because it's almost 1030 and I want those who need to get to the, uh, the contemporary service to get there. Let's pray.